The annual general managers meetings are underway, and Farhan Zaidi spoke with the San Francisco Chronicle and laid out uh, some hints about what the what the Giants intend to do this offseason. He also commented on Michael Conforto opting in, Sean Manaya opting out, and much more. So we will get into all of what he said next. You are Locked On Giants, your daily San Francisco Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Giants, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. My name is Ben Kaspek, and on the show, we provide daily episodes Monday through Friday, talking about the San Francisco Giants in a way that's data-driven and rational, but also simple, passionate, and accessible to all. I'm a former contributor for the baseball statistics and analysis websites Beyond the Box Score and Rotographs. I've been podcasting about the Giants since 2015, and I'm a lifelong fan. Thank you for making Lockdown Giants your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. Check us out there, and please hit that subscribe button wherever it is that you're following the show. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more, and right now new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to get started. And where we get started, uh, we have a number of topics I want to get to, including Patrick Bailey. I keep meaning to get into this and keep like teasing that I will. And finally, we will. Patrick Bailey not winning the Gold Glove Award at catcher. Was he snubbed? Or was it legitimate? Should he have won it? We will break down the metrics there and also some tidbits about Matt Chapman and the impending announcement about the coaching staff, which we've all been waiting patiently for. Um, But where I want to begin is this was actually an interview, I think, came out yesterday from John Shea in the San Francisco Chronicle from the GM meetings where he talked to Farhan Zaidi. It seems like there hasn't been a lot of Farhan Zaidi media availability there or Pete Patella for that matter. So we have to go with what we have. And what we have is just some little hints dropped about some of the intentions for the Giants this offseason. No, he didn't say, we're going to try to sign Shohei Otani. They, per, first, they just can't, they literally cannot name names of players, specific players who are um, free agents. They are not allowed to do so, so they would never say something like that. But um, one you know thing that stood out to me is that Zaidi said, quote, we've talked about athleticism and defense. Some of that you can get in free agency, but some of it may have to come in trades. We'll look to add a little bit more speed, a little bit more range in the outfield. We have a number of in-house options as well. And so there's two things I want to say about this. The first thing I want to say about this is that we heard this same kind of narrative last year, younger and more athletic. Like that was the buzzword of the giants like going into the off season they've got to get younger and more athletic and they just didn't do it and so you know I I guess they did get younger and like when he says we have a number of in-house options so and I guess they got more athletic you know I'm talking about like Casey Schmidt Marco Luciano Luis Matos Patrick Bailey like they did Kyle Harrison Uh, Ryan Walker, they did get younger. They definitely did. They let Evan Longoria go. They let Brandon Belt go. But it wasn't like their best players were very athletic players. They didn't have those. And and even guys like Matos struggled defensively in center field. Even Schmidt wasn't as great as advertised defensively. And I'm, I'm not saying they can't improve, but I am saying that it didn't really translate to like real impact on the field, but it sounds as if it's an intention again. And he's right about free agency in that by kind of definition, usually uh, free agents are older, right? Because it means they've accrued six years of service time. So there's the rare player who like came up when they were 20 and 
reaches free agency at like 26. Um, then there's also players internationally like uh, Jung Hoo Lee, who is a defensive center fielder, like defensive minded, speedy center fielder. They call him the grandson of the wind because I think his uh, grandfather was the son of the wind or something. Like that. I, I, it's a cool nickname, whatever it is and however he got it. But fast. And, and here's the thing. He's 25 years old. And so, you know, that that technically counts as free agency. But other than some perhaps a few options it would have to come in trades and so I just I'm at the point with kind of I'll believe it when I see it in terms of when a, when something is said like this I don't necessarily think to myself now oh that means it's going to happen because I'm not someone who who will go out there and say they promised a superstar I never heard a promise of a superstar we definitely heard signals that they were going to make every effort and they did and they did agree to terms you know with Carlos Correa but people say like they promised a superstar I don't show me where a promise was made and I think what you'll show me is like some random New Jersey reporter saying the Giants said they won't be underbid which I always make fun of because underbid is the wrong word to use there what they meant was overbid but regardless um, I don't take these comment like they he can say that all he wants, but until it happens, I just I'm not gonna believe it. Um, uh, the other thing to say is that it's crowded, right? And so it's hard. It's gonna be hard when he specifically mentions the outfield, and we have discussed this several times that with Michael Conforto opting in to next year's contract which was always a possibility we broke it down on i think monday and how to me it's not that big of a deal but it is that it is somewhat of a big deal just for 2024 and when he mentions trades i mean it gets me thinking about trading not necessarily from like the pitching young pitching depth that and not just depth, but young pitching talent, like when you talk about Tristan Beck and Keaton Wynn and Mason Black and Carson Wisenhunt and Hayden Birdsong, like guys like this, um, you could trade from that group, but you could also, I think they also need to clear room in the outfield because you've got Conforto, you've got Hanniger, those guys are under, those are the two highest paid players currently in terms of 2024 salary. Conforto's contract is up after 2024. Hanniger has a $15.5 million player option. None of these are like crazy figures and none of these are crazy long term. And so it's not that big of a deal in my opinion, but it is crowded. And I mentioned Yaz and Slater, I think. But then you also talk about Matos and Fitzgerald and guys like that. And so suddenly, how are you making like a meaningful upgrade there without, I mean, I guess... You could have Yastrzemski and Slater like as bench players or something. But I think if you could find a way to trade Michael Conforto or Mitch Hanniger, that may make more sense. If you actually add like a true, a truly good outfielder who is athletic and speedy and defensive oriented, like the grandson of the wind. So Coming up in just a minute, I'm going to get into some comments that Zaidi made about Michael Conforto, about Sean Manaya, and about pitching, the pitching market in general. And we'll, we'll also get into, finally, was Patrick Bailey snubbed for the National League Gold Glove Award at catcher? And before we get into all of that, I want to discuss our good friends over at FanDuel and what they're currently offering, which is something you definitely will not want to miss. So uh, right now, if you go to fanduel.com slash locked on, you can check this out for yourself and score early and often this NFL season with FanDuel, which is America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's 150 bucks if your team wins. And so I'm currently looking at the 49ers, of course. But you honestly, you could just look at whatever team is the most favored if you really just want to be sure. 
uh, to win this. And you place a $5 money line bet, like for example, on the 49ers at minus 162 to win over the Jaguars on Sunday. And if they win, you get 150 in bonus bets by going to fanduel.com slash locked on. So if you've been thinking of joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is super easy to use. You can bet on anything from spreads to player props, over-unders, and so much more, and every sport, too. So again, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Okay, here we go. We're going to get into more comments by Farhan Zaidi getting tidbits thanks to John Shea of the Chronicle, and then was Patrick Bailey snubbed for the Gold Glove Award at Catcher? Was he? It is a big question because he didn't win it, even though he was so great. Thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day, every dayers. Uh, Tomorrow on the show, if there's more comments that come out, if the coaching staff comes out, that's going to be the first priority. But otherwise, I want to get back to the Many great mailbag questions that we had from late last week. Lots of good ones left over. And so we will get into those or the latest, like if there's any actual kind of news and with the GM meetings, you do get that. But uh, what else did Farhan Zaidi have to say? Well, speaking of that crowded outfield, he commented on Michael Conforto. And he said, this is again, like what he actually thinks and what he said may not be aligned. What he said was, Regarding Michael Conforto, quote, a big thing for Michael was just making it through the year healthy, and he had stretches where he looked like his peak self. I think we'll see that more regularly next year, which we're excited about. He was a great fit in our clubhouse. He fits our roster really well, and I'm just happy to have him back. So I'm not sure that I'm just happy to have him back is necessarily true, given what I've just said about athleticism and crowdedness in the outfield. Saidi goes on to say, Michael played a solid outfield corner for us. And a year removed from surgery, I think he'll be moving around even better and be more comfortable throwing, although his throwing was really good last year. So there's not a lot of lies detected here, especially in his evaluation of Conforto. Um, when he said he has he had stretches where he looked like his peak self, that's true. He was like red hot a couple of times. But the problem was in between, he had stretches where he looked terrible. And so the overall result was like complete and utter, uh, you know, mediocre performance offensively. And defensively, I would say it was kind of a net negative. So when he says a solid outfield corner, I think it's kind of a euphemism for like, it wasn't the worst, but it wasn't great. And then he said a year removed from surgery. I think he'll move around better. That just kind of is saying he wasn't moving around great and we're hoping he'll be better. But anyway, he kind of like has no choice if asked about, oh, Michael Conforto picked up his option. What do you have to say about that? Like, what's he going to do? Say, we're really disappointed that Michael Conforto opted in. Anyway, So then he goes on to talk about Sean Manaya opting out and says, in the case of Sean, pitching's always in demand. It's really an economic decision for these guys. I'm sure we'll have conversation with conversations with his representation. We're going to be in the starting pitching market. It's a very deep pitching market in free agency. So we're going to be working our way through options like every team. So no surprise there. I doubt Manaya comes back, but it's a possibility. But I think it's more likely than not that he doesn't because I think they're they're mostly seeking like some of the top options in free agency because there are so many good starting pitchers out there, starting with Yoshinobu Yamamoto out of Japan, who's going to be posted shortly. And then once he's posted, 45-day window to sign with a team. And, uh, you know, we've heard guys like Alex Pavlovich say that Giants are planning like a full court press on Yoshinobu Yamamoto and Jung Huli and Shohei Otani. So again, I'll believe it when I see it. I'm at that point, you know, I'm skeptical like the rest of you, but that's where we are with that. And so now getting to Patrick Bailey, I think I finally should talk about this. 
Um, the reason I have have kind of avoided it is because it's a it's tricky. It's tricky to nail down was he snubbed or not. Um, actually, you know, maybe it's not that tricky <laughs> because uh, up at Statcast they have a fielding run value leader leaderboard, and um, it combines all the different things, right? Because we could talk about his framing, we could talk about his pop times, we could talk about his caught stealing success rate, we could talk about leadership qualities and intangibles, and uh, we could talk about his blocking, which actually was one area where Bailey wasn't that great. But um, baseball savant, I may have said fan graphs, baseball savant put together a fielding run value metric, which is just all encompassing. Let me just even read the definition. It said, it says fan uh, fielding run value is stat casts metric for capturing a player's measurable defensive performance by converting all of Statcast's individual defensive metrics from different scales onto the same run-based scale, which can then be read as a player being worth X runs above or Y runs below average. Currently, the uh, conversions for those metrics are as follows, and you can read it for yourself. But guess who was number two in all of baseball? Not just among not among catchers in all of baseball, Patrick Bailey at plus eighteen runs above average. And what is staggering about this is that Patrick Bailey did not play anywhere close to a full season. It looks like Fangraphs is actually down right now at the time of this recording, which really interferes with my ability to break this down in the way I wanted to. But Bailey, I mean, he he didn't play anywhere near a full season, and yet. He came in as the second most valuable player by this metric defensively. So that's incredible. And Tyro Estrada, by the way, sixth best at plus 14 runs above average is what it's saying. And he wasn't even a finalist. And so just by looking at that, yes, he was absolutely snubbed. And Gabriel Moreno of the uh, Arizona Diamondbacks ended up taking home the award and I'm trying to scroll to eventually find Gabriel Moreno uh, what on earth you know Gabriel Moreno I think he just had this ridiculous caught stealing rate and um, there he is at plus seven plus seven for uh, his defensive runs above average um or fielding run value, I should say, and that's runs above average. And Bailey was at plus 18. Did I give you the number? So almost three times as high in much less playing time. I think Moreno missed some time with like an injury or something, but nevertheless, and look, the voters aren't strictly going by this one thing. And if Fangraphs was working, it really is down right now. I was going to look at some other stuff, but you know, for Bailey, he was elite at framing like 100th percentile basically you know you could argue the best framer uh in baseball this year yes when you look and it's not even close honestly uh catcher framing runs he's at plus 16 for the year and the next closest player was at plus 13 and after that plus 10 and so bailey by you know these are qualified. I don't know what exactly counts as qualified. Let's do minimum 100 pitches caught. It's still Patrick Bailey as number one. And so uh, that's just kind of incredible. And then we look at pop times, and uh, he was also one of the best with pop times. He was third best. JT Real Muto, the Greek god of pop times, and then Rene Pinto, of the Tampa Bay Rays, it looks like. I don't even, I don't know how many attempts he had. He only had 11 attempts at pop times to second base, like throws to second base. So that, I kind of write that off a little bit. That's not enough. Bailey had 51 and his pop time was 1.87, tied for second best in the major leagues. And so, you know, caught stealing percentage, I can't look up because that's something I would have found on fan graphs. Blocking, Bailey was not great at. Like his blocking uh, metrics, Sable, by the way, last in MLB among uh, qualified catchers in blocking at minus 19 blocks above average. Um, 
and I, that checks that passes the eye test for me. And Bailey comes in 62nd out of 68 catchers here with minus nine blocks above average. But the beauty here is that the run value assigned to blocking, they've determined by analyzing all the data, I guess, that they can analyze to figure this out. It's way beyond my pay grade to know exactly how they determine the run value of, you know, for Sable minus 19. Like he didn't, he, an average catcher would have blocked a ball 19 more times than Sable did. But the conversion is that it only costs them five runs. And for Bailey, the minus nine blocks only cost them two runs. Whereas the framing, um, well, the, pop time i don't think it has the run value just shown there but the framing for bailey is plus 16 runs and so the the things that bailey excels at are worth more essentially is what i'm trying to say and in that in that um overall metric that i gave first which i'm trying to get back to now and it's (laughs) i keep hitting back and it's not taking me there i uh his yeah uh framing 16 runs throwing four runs and blocking minus two runs so overall 18 runs above average so that is why the catchers get down on one knee just by the way because teams have figured this out blocking like allowing a pass ball or a wild pitch every now and then is far less important than every single pitch like framing it and getting extra strikes it's just more it adds up to way more that's the reason you know it may not be an ideal blocking position but the the benefit of the framing far outweighs the negative of failure to block in certain circumstances i guess if the winning run is on third with you know in the bottom of the ninth or something then maybe blocking becomes more important than framing in that at bat but overall in the aggregate, like on the season, framing is far more important because there's so many pitches. And so there's so many more opportunities. And the blocking stuff, it doesn't happen nearly as frequently as a borderline pitch going your way or not your way. Anyway, uh, so yes, in my opinion, based on just this, he was totally snubbed. And he should have won this despite not playing nearly as many games as I think Moreno. But I can't look it up because of fan graphs. Anyway, coming up in just a minute, more tidbits. We've got tidbits on Matt Chapman, like kind of a rumor almost. And then what to expect with the coaching staff. We did hear a little bit from Zaidi about that. So we will get into it in just a minute. And before we do. All right, as promised, Matt Chapman and coaching staff tidbits. When are we going to hear? Zaidi said back when Melvin uh, was hired that it would probably be seven to ten days and i think we're already significantly past that are we about two weeks plus past that time and now he said it should be this week and so we'll get into exactly what he said thanks again for making locked on giants your first listen every day every day uh if we, if there's any updates like if the staff gets announced or if zaidi has any kind of bombshell quotes or pete patella if we ever hear from him uh, we'll break that down, but also we've got a, we're sitting on a bunch of great mailbag questions, so so look out for that. Uh, if nothing else kind of comes through tomorrow, but Matt Chapman, there, there's just been all these links, and it's kind of Andrew Baggerly like pushing it a little bit. He wrote a piece. I'm still like it's still saved in my browser. I haven't the art the title is "Don't Rule Out Matt Chapman Among Giants Free Agent Pursuits." Um, and he wrote this a long time ago, and I still haven't finished reading it yet. So there's that. I've I've personally talked about Matt Chapman several times in the last week plus. Um, we talked about him yesterday, doing looking through MLB trade rumors, top 50 free agents with predictions. Um, the contract prediction I thought was pretty high, given the inconsistency the streakiness uh and the fact that he was really bad for a significant stretch of last season um but that he does make he also does make sense in a lot of ways so i'm kind of torn on the fit but the contract was kind of eye-popping but anyway 
Andrew Baggerly says from the GM meetings that free agent third baseman Matt Chapman attended the GM meetings today, and this was yesterday, Tuesday. Baggerly continues, quote, he spent several minutes chatting with Giants manager Bob Melvin, of course, with whom he has a relationship from his time in Oakland. And so there, there's definitely connections here. And then today on Wednesday, I think it was John Heyman reported that like Matt Chapman was at the GM meetings and he spoke to at least one team. Well, uh, you missed Baggerly's tweet from the day prior when he literally said Matt Chapman was there and he met with Bob Melvin. So we know that he at least met with the Giants, essentially. And then in terms of the coaching staff, Farhan Zaidi said the Giants expect to announce their coaching staff within the week, and they have spoken with former big league manager and pitching coach Brian Price. That's, again, according to Andrew Baggerly. So we keep hearing connections to Brian Price. His background is extensive. Like, I didn't quite realize that he started... um, he was a pitching coach for the Mariners in the early 2000s. That may have overlapped with um, Bob Melvin's time when he was a new manager. And uh, Brian Price was part of the Padres. He was on, I don't think he was part of the coaching staff, but he was like an advisor or something to the coaching staff, something weird like that with the Padres under Bob Melvin last year. So we keep hearing about Brian Price. We've heard about him you know, a lot of the weight probably has to do with guys potentially looking for other jobs, like perhaps Andrew Bailey departing, and then you've got an opening at pitching coach. So you all of that needs to get sorted out. You can't like if if Bailey's interviewing elsewhere, you can't announce your staff until Bailey has made a decision one way or another. So that's probably partially what's holding things up. But we also, I listened to the Giants Talk podcast. It was Laura Britt uh, interviewing Bob Melvin, and he talked about the coaching staff, and he said, you know, it was November 1st at the time, and that a lot of, or that's when coaching contracts are expired, and that that means you can start talking to guys who are in other organizations, and he said that, we, that they were doing some of that, but he also specifically mentioned Matt Williams, and that he would very much like him to join the staff. And so very much expect Matt Williams to be on the staff, probably Brian Price as well. He also mentioned having some continuity. So I would expect, you know, Alyssa Nacken and and Kai Correa and Mark Hallberg. Those are like my three guesses. Uh, And then he also, Bob Melvin also mentioned some former giants like, um, uh, you know, like uh, we've we've heard Pat Burrell, we've heard J.T. Snow, we've heard uh, Ryan Vogel song, we've heard names like that, and so it's, I'm just very intrigued by what this staff will be. But until we hear what it is, we just don't know. I'm also kind of most intrigued, perhaps, uh, of all the things about what they're going to do with their hitting group, because you know it's well documented, especially on this show. The departure of Donnie Ecker, um, the arrival and departure of Donnie Ecker is like a perfect correlation with the Giants hitting well and then hitting poorly. And then he goes to Texas and the arrival of Donnie Ecker and the pre-arrival of Donnie Ecker really correlates with the team struggling offensively and then the team becoming really good offensively. And it's beyond Seager and Simeon. It's like... Jonah Heim and Josh Young and Laoti Tavares and just kind of up and down the lineup. They had a rookie batting third. I forget his name, Evan Carter or something, um, and having offensive success. And so uh, what do the Giants do? Like, I just don't think that they stick with Justin Veely and Dustin Lind as kind of the main guys. There's somebody else is on that staff who replaced Ecker, and I always forget what his name is. Is it Pedro Guerrero? I forget, and I apologize if I got that wrong. But, you know, the the hitting group was unable to help these guys when they went through just a miserable funk for, like, the last four months. of. Or it was more like half of the season. First half of the season, they were fine. Second half of the season, right around the end of June, 
and just unt- throughout the end of the season, they were one of the worst offensive teams in the game. And overall, because they were like a little better than average for the first half, but then like way below average for the second half. So the overall numbers came out to like pretty significantly, not hugely, but sig- not just barely below average overall offensively last season. And and I think that I'm very interested to see what that hitting staff ends up being and whether Vili or Lind or the other guy keep their jobs. So we will find that out probably this week. And today's already Wednesday night. Um, anyway, thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first or your last. I'm liking to joke here. Listen every day. If you don't know by now, I've moved and my schedule is insane and so I'm recording at night and I apologize if that's inconvenient, but it is how it is for now and I hope to get back on normal schedule at some point in the not too distant future. But anyway, once again, my name is Ben Kaspik. Check me out on Twitter or X at Ben Kaspik, K-A-S-P-I-C-K. If you like this show, please consider rating it or leaving a review. It helps me out a lot, so thanks in advance. And thank you to everyone who's done so already. Can't wait to be with you again tomorrow. Again, any news that comes out or a mailbag uh, is what we'll be discussing. So, yeah, thanks again for listening. You are now Locked on Giants.